Cool. Function of one variable, we'll call it f of t. Yeah? And we can approximate f of t 
straight line. Call it P, polygon, or polynomial, whatever you want. So let's say that I sample my function at two places, yeah? F of t and f of t plus h. And we're going to go through sort of a high school calculus derivation here that shows that our approximation is somewhat reasonable. So in particular, by the, the mean value theorem, which I think we used in two lectures ago, uh, we know that there's some point between f of t and f of t plus h where you can find the slope of this line between these two guys. And that slope has got to be achieved as a tangent uh, somewhere between these two vertices. Right? Hopefully this sounds pretty familiar. We'll call that point t star right, between these two endpoints. And we can draw a tangent line at those two points. And I showed that in blue here. And now, if you look at the distance between the tangent line and the vertices of this object, or really uh, any point along this line p here, we know that sort of the, the, the distance is on the order of h squared, because to first order, this line upstairs uh, and, and this one downstairs sort of approximate one another. So what, what does this de little derivation show us? Well, it shows us that these piecewise linear building blocks that we're constructing our surface approximation out of, namely these little triangle faces, um, are, are sort of reasonable objects. In particular, it's a quadratic looking approximation to the actual surface, meaning that if I add more and more and more polygons, and, and this is a very informal proof, uh, then, then eventually what will happen is the convergence rate of sort of what my surface actually is uh, compared to what these little piecewise linear building blocks are telling me uh, will we'll, 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 we'll approach one another in a quadratic rate. So it turns out it actually doesn't take that many triangles uh, to get a pretty good approximation of a smooth surface, which is great. Um, in addition, there are a lot of other advantages to using triangle meshes to talk about surfaces. For one thing, they're very easy to render. Right? If, uh, how many people have taken, I don't know, CS 148, 248, some kind of graphics class? Yeah, uh, no doubt, like the third topic conservatively that you talk about in this class is how to draw a triangle, right? And, and there's a little bit of a chicken and egg question, right? I mean, who knows whether the geometry people invented meshes first and then we went back and invented all these methods for, for rasterizing triangles. But I would say that really the truth lies halfway between. The drawing triangles is a pretty easy problem, even in huge volumes. And so rendering a 3D surface represented this way is, is not a very difficult thing to do. Um, also, we can achieve uh, nice topologies here. Right? You, can, you can construct objects with arbitrary unions of donuts pretty easily out of uh, triangle meshes, which can be difficult to do, actually, with, with certain implicit type representations. And finally, they're, they're, they sort of form the basis for some of these methods, like subdivision and refinement where you take a rough looking mesh approximation to a surface and you start adding vertices to make it look smoother. There are a lot of different advantages to uh, triangle meshes. And we'll return to this choice uh, later on in lecture and, and, and talk about one or two others. So really, triangle meshes encode two different pieces of information about your surface. Right? One is obviously the geometry, where things are. And the other is the topology. Uh, probably most people in this room have heard this word before, but in case you haven't, uh, topology is just the study of geometric properties that remain invariant under certain transformations. It's a very vague definition, uh, the one that I kind of like, and I'm sure that, that people like Michael have a very different view of what topology is. But basically, you know, you know the, 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 the example from topology that we all talk about is that, you know, topologists think that a donut and a coffee cup are the same, right? Because both of them have one hole, namely the uh, handle of, a, of the coffee cup, yeah? And the reason for that is that I can take the coffee mug and I can apply this really bizarre geometric transformation to it. In fact, if you go to Wikipedia and you search for topology, you'll see a nice little animation of this happening, uh, where, where the, you can kind of push a, a coffee mug together and eventually get a donut uh, shape out of it without sort of smashing together any holes, which are very important in topological objects. So in a triangle mesh, uh, when we talk about the geometry and topology of a triangle mesh, oftentimes what people mean is something, something to this effect. Where the geometry of the triangle mesh is pretty clear, right? Namely, this thing has a bunch of vertices. And when we talk about its geometry, we're more or less just talking about where the vertices are in three space. Reasonable enough. So, so an example geometric statement about life would be something like, this vertex is at point x, y, z. Yeah? To contrast with that, a topological statement about the, uh, the triangle mesh for the dolphin here 
would say something to the effect that these two vertices are connected. Right? So when we talk about the topology of a triangle mesh, uh, there's sort of two dual things that we'll be talking about. The first, at the low level, is how the vertices are connected to the edges and how the edges are connected together to form faces. And then the high level, uh, we can also talk about the topology of a triangle mesh as um, in, in similar ways to the ways that we talk about the topology of any other surface, like counting the number of holes that it has, uh, counting, counting different types of singularities, and so on. So how do we represent a triangle mesh? Well, uh, my, my point is kind of like this. It doesn't really matter how we formalize, because I think our intuition is all pretty clear about how, how this all works. Right? But, but to, to try to make things a little bit more formal, uh, we, could, we could have a set of vertices, we'll call it B, right? The subset of Rn, so, so I don't really care that our, our triangle mesh is in 2 space, 3 space, 25 space, it's all good. Uh, we'll have a set of edges which connect vertices to one another, right? When you have V cross V, that's just pairs of vertices. Then we'll have a set of faces that you can think of as triplets of vertices um, under the conditions that, that if, you, if you take the faces and you find their edges, you get E. If you take the edges and you find their, their edges, their boundary, you get the vertices. Right? Um, plus these manifold conditions. And I don't think we need to write them down in, in, in here, uh, but, but it's, it's easy to, to see how you might take this representation and, for example, generalize it a little bit by adding tetrahedra, and now you can represent a volumetric object and so on. And the, uh, the term for the most general version of this, or a generalized version of this, is a uh, uh, simplicial complex, right? Where, where each of these objects, like, Vertices, edges, and faces are, are simplices, okay? and they each one is sort of the boundary of the one above it. Yeah. So, what are some vocabulary words we need to talk about triangle meshes? Probably the most important is valence. Uh, I guess sometimes we say degree. Uh, basically, the valence of a vertex is the number of edges coming out of it. The valence of this edge, uh, the vertex that I'm drawing for you here, happens to be six, which is an important number, and we'll return to that in a moment. And what sorts of things can we say about uh, triangle meshes? Well, probably the, one of the world's most famous theorems that comes out of math uh, is the one that we've shown here, where you take the number of vertices, you subtract the number of edges, and you add the number of bases, B minus E plus F, and this equals the Euler characteristic of your surface type. Um, in particular, uh, if your, your surface has two or has G holes in it, then the Euler characteristic is 2 minus 2G. Two so let's do some examples here. We have a uh, soccer ball. We're pretty sure the soccer ball doesn't have any holes in it. So his genus, or G, is 0. His Euler characteristic is 2. Meaning that if I have a nice manifold mesh representing this sphere, or yeah, this sphere here, and we take his vertices, track the edges, add faces, we will get 2 back out. Similarly, if our surface has one hole, then we'll get zero out. If it has two holes, I guess we'll get a minus two out. By the way, it was a challenge online to find a uh, double torus uh, photograph. But these are the sorts of things we must do when we're teaching a class. Uh, anyway, uh, you might have seen a, a, a sort of an elementary proof of this in, in um, some sort of geometry class. We'll, we'll defer that for now um, and, and save it maybe for when we talk about integration and forms and so on. But let's think about some, some consequences. So remember, our, our, our big formula is going to be up here, b minus e plus f to the chi. And, and remember that in, in the, the case of a triangle mesh, we have an important piece of information, namely that our geometry isn't just constructed out of polygons, it's constructed out of triangles. Right? And we're going to take, take advantage of that fact to develop some estimates about meshes that are uh, sort of we use in our everyday lives as geometry people. So first of all, uh, each edge in triangle mesh, we'll assume that our mesh is closed and have boundary or anything. Uh, each edge is adjacent to exactly two faces. Unlike vertices, which can have whatever the, the heck valence you want, an edge has to be adjacent to two faces, assuming that your surface doesn't have boundary. Yeah? And in particular, each face also has to have three edges, right? So in particular, if, 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 you, if you take your set of edges and you double count them, one for each face that it's adjacent to, you better get three times the number of faces that you have in your mesh. So two times the number of edges is equal to three times the number of faces. Hopefully everybody agrees with me in my little uh, derivation here. 
So we've effectively just uh, been able to make this little substitution and simplify uh, the theorem that we had before to have v minus one half f equals pi, right? Just by substituting this guy. So can we make any other estimates? Well, typically our surface, remember that chi is equal to two minus two times the number of volts, right? This genus thing. Typically your surface isn't gonna have like a billion volts. In fact, I would argue that the number of poles that the typical uh, surface and data set we use has is on average exactly zero. And then there'll be like that one equal test case that has like one hole. So we can think of this number chi as being a very small object. And in particular, uh, if our surfaces are approximated with tons of vertices and tons of faces, this means that to some approximation, the number of faces is approximately two times the number of vertices. You guys understand that this is a squiggly equal sign here. Namely, that uh, if our surface, for whatever reason, does have a really bizarre genus, then this approximation will no longer hold. This is a rule of thumb. But it makes, uh, our, makes our estimations a lot easier. In particular, uh, we now have the number of edges is approximately three times the number of vertices on a surface. Number on a, sorry, on a triangular mesh. And that the number of faces is approximately two times the number of vertices. Right, so, if we, so what does this, uh, this little derivation tell us? Well, it tells us that if we write an algorithm in terms of the number of edges, the number of faces, or the number of vertices, then more or less, in the sort of big O standpoint, uh, we, can, we can always analyze them in terms of the number of vertices. Right, because they're all off by a constant vector. Right, this three and this two are just constants. They have nothing to do with uh, the, the, the geometry, topology, and surface. Well, I guess the, the second one sort of does. Usually not. By the way, uh, the average valence of a vertex um, is six. Can we can we think of a reason why? Anybody have an idea? Yeah. Uh, there are three vertices per edge. Um, each edge is kind of twice what we have all the valence. Exactly. So so each edge type touches two different vertices, right? So he contributes to the valence of two different vertices on your mesh. Right? So if your edge is equal to three times the number of, of uh, vertices, right, then the sort of average contribution to valence is six times the number of vertices. So on average, there's a valence of about six. Cool? So these are good rules of thumb to keep in back of our head. So what's another piece of information that's useful to know about a triangle mesh? Well, <laughs> another one, which is the source of endless confusion, is orientability. So probably we've all heard of the Mobius strip, yeah? Has anybody not heard of it? Yeah. So, so the idea here is you take a strip of paper, you twist it once, and then you take the endpoints and you join them back together. And this forms a perfectly valid surface, guys. So, so for some reason, a uh, common misconception, at least in the, the undergrad differential geometry class that I took, is that somehow the Mobius strip is not a surface, and that's not true. It is a, it's a surface. I can make it by taking paper, because then it's putting them together. What it's not is an oriental surface. But what we should keep in the back of our head is that doesn't mean that all of the techniques that we'll talk about in this class fail on the, on the Mobius strip. In fact, that's, that's, that's definitely not true. Uh, for example, in my next lecture, I'll be talking about uh, discrete ways that we can estimate curvature of a surface. And one thing we'll learn about curvature is that it only depends on the surface as you can view it sort of right around your feet. Right? That is, you don't have to have a global view of uh, what the surface looks like to compute how it bends locally. To understand the curvature of a surface, right, if I'm standing in the middle of this Mobi strip and I just look in some little neighborhood, it looks like any other surface too. The fact that globally the surface is not orientable, namely I can't come up with a set of normals on the surface that's somehow consistent, doesn't flip on itself, really is not important for those definitions. At least up to sign. There's some, 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 some piece of information about curvature that depends which direction is up. But if we agree on that direction, the line is good. And locally, we can do that. But even so, understanding when a surface is orientable is a very important piece of information. Um, so remember, and, and we'll return to this, I think, in the next lecture um, a little bit. But uh, from, from computer graphics, we probably know that, that a surface has, emits this object called a normal. right? Normal is just a vector perpendicular to the surface. And if surface is orientable, if I can come up with a field of normal vectors across the entire surface, 
uh, that, that, that's continuous. Now what goes wrong with the Mobius strip here is the classic example. It is I'll have this normal vector, right? He'll be walking around the surface, and then when he gets the twist, he'll flip to the other side of the surface, right? And when you come back to where you started, now the normal is pointing in, right? But that's, that's not so great, because what we hope, if we have a continuous field of normal vectors, is that I should be able to draw a path all the way around this loop and have this continuously varying normal vector from point to point to point. Yeah. Unfortunately, on a triangle mesh, the word continuous is a little bit suspect. Right? We've already sort of broken at least uh, you know, differentiability by having these sharp edges between triangles. Right? So to say that we have a continuous field of normal vectors would require a little bit of uh, definition. So instead, we sidestep that a little bit when we talk about how to orient a triangle mesh. And instead of talking about normal vectors, uh, we give each face an orientation like clockwise or counterclockwise. And we say that a uh, triangle mesh is orientable if we can come up with a consistent set of orientations. In particular, uh, you notice that, that, that if you look at the surface locally, right, then a consistent set of orientations will, will assign to each face the same sort of clockwise or counterclockwise direction. Another way of thinking about this is that if you look at an edge, the two adjacent orientations are sort of going in opposite directions. Right? So these guys are both going um, counterclockwise. <laughs> but uh, you can notice that this, uh, because of that, this counterclockwise direction is going to face up this edge, and this counterclockwise direction is going to face down this edge. Right? So if I can associate little circles that do that on every single uh, base of my triangle mesh, then I'll call it orientable. Um, notice that this actually does, in some way, uh, recall our, our, our definition of orientability in the continuous case as having this continuous field of normals. Uh, one way to, to recover that is by remembering the right hand rule. So, so remember in, in uh, probably in physics class, you might have learned about the right hand rule where if you take the cross product of two things or if you look at the curl of a vector field and so on. Uh, one way to understand that is you take your right hand and you twist your fingers around that orientation and then your thumb points out um, in, in whatever direction you're trying to talk about, cross product direction, right? So basically, when we talk about discrete orientability, all we're requiring is that your surface admits a consistent right hand rule for uh, computing normals to faces. So reasonable enough. So remember, in our in our list of assumptions that we should uh, we should keep in the backs of our heads, uh, we're also going to assume for the most part in this class that meshes are orientable. Um, and this is another one of these questions you should ask when you're evaluating the algorithms that we talk about, which is, first of all, is, does it require that our methods are manifold? And I'd say 98% of the methods we talk about will. Uh, and the second one will be, does, do we actually care whether our surface is orientable? And a smaller but still considerable percentage of the algorithms we talk about will require orientability, sometimes in a kind of subtle way. So we've talked a lot about what a triangle mesh is and some of the important properties it has to have. Of course, as computer scientists, we have to actually be able to store these objects. And we must be able to represent both the geometry and the topology of our triangle mesh sort of simultaneously. Uh, namely, we have to talk about the locations of the points on the surface and how they're connected together. So, so let's think about some ways to do that. Now, probably the stupidest possible way to do this would be to have just triangle soup. By the way, this is a technical term. You'll see this in these papers. Uh, triangle soup, all we're saying here is that we're going to have a list of points. X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. That's triangle one. Triangle two is X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Triangle three, X, Y, Z, X, Z, and so on. Right? And there's no topological information here whatsoever. Right? In particular, if two faces share a vertex and I want to store my mesh as triangle soup, then I'll just repeat that vertex twice. Now, there are lots of obvious drawbacks to this data structure, but there are also actually some advantages. In particular, let's say that I am OpenGL and I want to render all of these triangles. I don't really care that this vertex and that vertex over there are actually the same. And in fact, space these days is so cheap that maybe for me, what's more important is cache coherence, right? And I want to be able to look at the three vertices of my triangle in one little spot of memory rather than having to have these random lookups, right? In that case, actually writing down uh, my triangle mesh uh, 
matrices is the best thing to do. Um, and you see that, right? So if you're a uh, OpenGL 1.0 user like I am, because I'm out of date, then there's this nice GL begin, GL triangles uh, command here, which literally you run this thing and then you give it all its fragments just like that and run it for you. And, and I'm, I think more recent versions of OpenGL do the same thing in a slicker way. Uh, so you've no doubt seen some form of this before. Now, in terms of space and in terms of a lot of the types of queries that we wanna, we're, we're going to want to do on a triangle mesh, uh, this is obviously a highly suboptimal way to store things in memory. And there's a very obvious way to factor things out a little bit and start to make our lives easier. Namely, what we could do is store a list of vertices and a list of faces, right? And that way, if we have a vertex appearing twice, um, our list of faces, like vertex one here, appears in two different triangles, uh, we'll, we'll just reference into that list of vertices. Right? Um, now, if you ever see a triangle mesh stored in .obj format, uh, that's all this format is doing. In fact, probably in, in one of your, your next assignments, we'll have you loading and playing with either OBJ or OFF meshes, both of which more or less have this, uh, this structure to them. So what's going on here? So let's say that we have uh, five vertices here. One, two, three, four, five. And we have two different faces. Right? And you can see that all the OBJ format is doing is saying, so the first uh, face here is vertices one, five, and three. Right? And it goes one, five, three. And you notice that I was very careful to do this in counterclockwise order. Uh, namely, it's a very polite thing to do for the people using your meshes to, to list your vertices with the orientation already given. Is it that difficult to fix the orientation if somebody was not so kind? No, it's not so hard. But uh, this is one other thing that we have to remember to do. So let's talk about a simple algorithm that we might want to implement on a triangle mesh and see whether or not this data structure is so maybe my mesh is a little bit noisy, my vertices have been displaced in different ways, and I'd like to smooth them out a little bit. Um, one very simple way, which we'll actually, in a couple lectures, uh, refine a little bit to a pretty stable method for smoothing a mesh. Um, it, it looks something like, uh, like, like what I put here, where we'll say for each of n iterations, we'll iterate over all the vertices on my mesh and replace each vertex V with the average of its position from before and the average of its neighbors, right? So in other words, if you look at the topology of the mesh, I'm going to stand at a vertex and I'm going to look at all of my neighbors. And I'm going to average their position and say that the average of their position should be approximately my own. So in fact, I'm going to replace my position with a little bit of that. Yeah, reasonable enough. Now, if I stored my mesh in OBJ format, Right? So I just have a list of vertices and a list of triangles. This algorithm is going to be a huge pain to implement. Right? Now why is that? Well, I have this funny expression here, the, all the way at the bottom here, where I'm asking for the average of my neighbors. But an OBJ format mesh doesn't have any real way to find my neighbors. Right? All I have is this list of triangles. So if I want to find all the people adjacent to me, I'm going to have to go down the entire list of triangles. Right? and find any triangles that list myself and somebody else in them. Right? In particular, each uh, inner loop of this, uh, this, this, this little method I outlined here actually sort of implicitly includes another inner loop right? over all the faces of the mesh uh, to find my neighbors. That's really slow. Right? If, my, if my mesh has like 2 million faces, then this is going to take forever to do one iteration of smoothing. But somehow this looks like it should be an easy operation. And so I'd argue that Basically, our data structure just isn't quite right. So what are some typical queries that we're going to want to do on a triangle mesh? Well, they tend to look something like this. Uh, for example, we just talked about um, looking for the neighboring vertices to a given vertex, right? looking at the one ring. Um, you might look for the faces that are adjacent to a given edge. You might look for the edges that are adjacent to the face, the edges that are adjacent to the vertex. So you know of a whole list of these things and sort of reasonable localized operations you might do on a triangle mesh that would benefit from these sorts of operations. And what we notice is that they're mostly localized, right? There are relatively few things that we're going to want to do on a triangle mesh that will involve sort of stepping back and globally looking at the entire object at one time, at least at these sort of low level here. So again, these are all sort of, you know, we use words like neighboring and adjacent, and we'd like a data structure uh, that, that really 
for flight to spec. And so one of the most popular options these days is an object called the half edge. Uh, folks from CS348A had the pleasure of playing with this object a little bit last quarter. And the basic idea of the half edge data structure is that we're going to continue to store a list of vertices and faces. I'm going to add to that one additional object, which is called a half edge. Um, and this is a structure that's two information. So let's, let's zoom in a little bit here. So let's say that I have a triangle mesh, and uh, <laughs> I guess we've literally zoomed in a bunch, and I'm looking at an edge and his neighboring faces here. In fact, this works for a polygonal mesh too, as long as it's uh, manifold and orientable. And we'll return to why orientable matters in a minute. So the difference between a half edge and just a normal edge on the surface is that I take each edge and I divide them into two. Namely, for example, let's say I have this edge between these two vertices, then I can think ahead, although I don't actually do this, of displacing this edge up a little bit and calling this half edge number one, displacing this edge down a little bit and calling that half edge number two. In other words, what we do is we say that a half edge is sort of an edge associated with one of its two neighboring faces. And we can give the half edge an orientation, right? Remember that our mesh is orientable, so we can draw these counterclockwise directions on all the faces. And just like I talked about before, right, that means that I can associate with the half edge downstairs um, the direction going in this way, and the half edge upstairs the direction going down. Yeah. So I've implicitly taken advantage of the fact that my mesh is orientable to construct this object. Cool? So what sorts of information do I store on the half edge? Well, each vertex only really needs to store one, one piece of information, which is just the index of some half edge going out of it. Turns out that'll be enough. By the way, if you look at sort of practical implementations of half edges, they tend to store more information than what I'll give you, but this is sort of the minimal set to do all of the operations we'll talk about. Each phase, or when I say phase, I mean triangle here, um, but again, this works for polygonal measures too. Each phase will also just store some arbitrary adjacent half edge. So for example, this triangle here might store this green guy here. Perfectly fine. And then the thing that's going to link it all together, which is unsurprising given that it's called the half edge data structure, is going to be the half edge itself. And he stores four pieces of information. Namely, I store the flip of the half edge. Remember, I've taken each edge and split it into two different half edges. Right? So if I have this green guy here, then his flip will be the blue guy above him. Right? That's represented by this little orange area here. We'll store the next half edge, which just circulates around a face in a counterclockwise direction. Right? So if we're again the green guy, right? then the uh, next half edge for him will be the one whose tail he kind of points into. So it'll be this green guy down here. We'll store the face associated with this half edge. Remember, there's no ambiguity anymore as to which of these two faces our half edge touches now, because we split the edge in half. And finally, we'll store the, uh, the base vertex. Right? So if I have a half edge that points like this, then the base vertex will be this guy here. Does that make sense? So this is sort of a nice, reasonable way of storing the topology for mesh. By the way, this is a topological data structure, right? If I wanted to add geometry to this thing, how would I do it? Well, I would just stick x, y, z locations at these vertices. And, and what sorts of things can we do with it? So let's return a little bit to our example here of uh, this, this simple Laplacian-looking smoothing for a mesh. So how would we go about smoothing this mesh? Well, remember that we want to look at all of his neighbors. And so basically, the, the operation that we're going to need is iterating over the, all of the neighbors of the given vertex. Yeah? So we'll call this function iterate of b, where vertex is b. Well, what can we do? So let's say that we're staring, hmm, I should have called it iterate of c, I suppose. That's OK. So let's say that we're standing at vertex c. Well, what I can do is I can ask my mesh for some arbitrary outgoing half edge. Let's say this guy, right? And now to iterate over his neighbors, what can I do? Well, first of all, to figure out what this guy is pointing to, uh, who can tell me how, how an expression for, for finding the end point of this half edge here? Yeah, so how do you get the other vertex on the half edge? Remember, he only stores his base. 
Yeah, so what you'll do is you'll take this, this half edge, you'll flip them over, right? So now his base became tip, tip became base, and now you can get the, uh, the, the, the base point of the flipped half edge, and that's the thing that he's pointing to. Does this game make sense? It's actually a very fun game to play if you're, if you're in the, how do you walk around a half edge? And these are the sorts of games you have to play. So to iterate over all the neighbors, what do we do? Well, first of all, um, we can process the, you can see I gave the answer on it. Uh, you can take your edge and flip and then take his front vertex, right? And that'll give you the thing he's pointing to. And then how am I going to get to the next half edge and continue this iteration? We'll take a look at this flipped half edge. What is his next? Remember that his face is now pointing into the vertex at the center. So if I go to the next, I'm going to iterate around C and onto the next half edge that's also pointing around at, at C. Right? So, you, so look what I just did. I started at half edge 3 and ended up at, wait, at the half edge 3. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I started out at this half edge and I ended up at that half edge. And how did I do it? Well, I took him, I flipped him over, and then I moved to the next guy. Okay. So anyway, these are just some random games that we play when we're walking around a uh, half edge data structure, and they allow us to do all kinds of interesting topological ones. Uh, yeah. So this fails if it's an open fan, right? Uh, you mean like in this case here? Because um, you loop till you get back to the start edge and you loop to it. No, I think you're. I think you're okay. It, it depends how you define your your half edge mesh. So let's say that this edge, where where an actual edge to your surface. If you had this half edge store this guy as his next, then you'd still be on right. Um, I think. Well, but you'd have to tag him as boundaries. You would, boundary. and usually, and usually just do that. You just call it a, a, a boundary edge. Another way of thinking about this is that there's like, if, if, if you talked about projective geometry, then, then one way to think about this is that, um, so let's say that I'm triangulating a planar object. Right, then really, if you're, if you're a projective geometry, then, then your planar object is actually sitting on the sphere, and the outer part of your planar object is just another polygon that just has a ton of edges to it. Um, and indeed, the half edge actually thinks about it that way, but that's too strange to worry about. It. Okay, so this is a pretty reasonable data structure. We're storing a triangle mesh, and we'll encode 90. 4% of the operations that we want to do, and we'll, and we'll kind of know when, when this isn't enough and how we can supplement it. In fact, we'll return to that in a few minutes. Um, and we're only scratching the surface of methods for even just storing triangle meshes. In fact, I just kind of grabbed two recent papers on um, different problems that, that are involved in, in just literally storing these objects and processing them in very simple ways. Uh, for example, maybe uh, I'm making a website that has 3D content, and what matters to me is that I see some 3D mesh as quickly as possible. Right? So maybe I'm making a cell phone game, and I get to level 10, and all of a sudden the new alien shows up, and even if the alien is made of like four tetrahedra initially, what's really important to me is that I see the bad guy, and then I can you know, backfill the nice looking geometry, as opposed to having my game just halt and wait for the whole model to load. In that case, you have a streaming representation that you have to worry about for triangle meshes. Um, and in, in other cases, maybe you just care about using the smallest number of bits to represent a triangle mesh. And if you look at the OBJ format or the uh, half edge, you'll see that there's a little bit of redundancy um, that you can whittle down that this is very important to you. But we don't have a whole lot of time for that. Oh, sorry, question? Um, just for context. So you'd have a list of vertices, those faces, and then just also a list of edges? <coughs> yeah, a list of face-to-face uh, connections. So I think just about every combination of these has been explored somewhere. Yeah. Um, in fact, that one has a name, but I can't remember what it is. Do you have sort of just a list of pointers between edges? Um, we'll talk about the jewel of a mesh uh, in a few moments, and I'm wondering if what you're talking about would be basically a half-edge data structure on the jewel of the, the mesh. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try to think of a better answer for you. Uh, for the most part, these are engineering decisions, and you just need to choose a data structure that does most of the queries that, that you care about. Um, most of the algorithms that we talk about, for mm, sometimes not for not so great reasons, usually involve just like 
doing little operations on positions or vertices nearby. So we need structures that, that make that type of operation as exposed as possible or what we tend to prefer. But uh, why we do them on the vertices when there's all this geometry in between is uh, an interesting question that, that should have more consideration when we get that. Our recent submission, uh, our recent paper submission, used mesh processing, but we didn't use any hacker chain structure. We just found the adjacency matrix and then just did some matrix manipulation in that one. It's true. Although, to be fair, if we had used a half edge, would it would have been a lot yeah, faster. True. <laughs> okay. Um, however, that wasn't the, uh, the rate limiting step, as kind of said, uh, so it didn't really matter. Anyway, so, so, so if we step back a little bit, uh, we can think of our triangle mesh as having a dimensionality structure in the same way that Adrian suggested that a generalization of a surface is this object called a manifold. Uh, that has, you know, n-dimensional sort of, uh, well, n-dimensions associated with the, the, the local geometry. In particular, you can think of a face, right? Face is just triangle. Triangles are sort of two-dimensional objects, right? Edges have one dimension, right? They look like lines, and vertices have sort of zero dimensions, which is false. So we can associate with this sort of structure a, uh, an operator that takes you from a, uh, one of these topological objects to the next, Namely, if I have a triangular face, I can think of the boundary of the triangular face as just a union of three linear looking edges. And I can think of the boundary of a, uh, you know, a line segment edge as a union of two vertices. And indeed, you'll see this little partial derivative symbol a few times, which is really a fortunate choice of notation for differential geometry because you take derivatives a lot, um, which will take you from uh, the face, the union of his three boundary edges, and so on. In fact, in topology, usually we, we associate an additional piece of information with these objects. Uh, namely, remember that our faces have orientation to them. Right? So not only do we, uh, when we take the boundary of an object, we don't just think of it as the union of a bunch of stuff, but we actually associate an orientation to it. So for example, if my face is uh, assigned this counterclockwise <coughs> direction here, then maybe I'll, I'll give the three edges that, that are put together to, to make the boundary of this space. We'll give them each arrows associated with those. And in fact, you can even do that with the, uh, taking the boundary of an edge and getting a vertex. And usually the way that we do that is simply by putting plus and minus ones on the two boundary vertices. So anyway, this is something to kind of keep in back of your head and think about for later, uh, because this kind of structure is going to be very important for us. Namely, if you're able to construct this uh, sign the boundary operator in the right way. Something that you'll notice is that if you apply it twice, right? So if I take the triangle and I take his boundary to get three edges, and then I take the union of those three edges with orientations attached in the right way, and I take the boundary of that, right, the sign signs in a consistent way, then you'll probably get zero. Um, this could be a very useful structure for us later. Oh, sure. Given that there's, the other two edges are missing, Ah, yes, yeah, that was an unfortunate uh, choice, enjoy the picture. Uh, let's see here. So let's say that I have a triangle. There he is. And there's the orientation. Okay. So if I take the first boundary, what's going to happen? I'm going to get this wrong, but I'll try. So there's one edge, there's two edges, there's three edges, right? And I'm not going to put plus and minus ones on this. And then, what happens if I take the boundary of this union of oriented edges? Well, what we'll do is we'll put a minus one on all the tails, and a plus one on all the heads. Yeah, so you get minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one. So in particular, if you look at the three vertices of this triangle, you notice that each one is associated with both a plus and a minus, so they all vanish. Um, and if you think of a triangle mesh as just a union of a bunch of objects that look like this, uh, you'll notice that, that, that the same structure holds. In fact, if you can fill in the interior of your mesh with tetrahedra and you apply boundary flex to the it'll uh, still give you zero. Uh, this is a very important structure that, that we'll, I think we'll actually see a few times in, in this class of different ways. So, what, what sorts of questions might we ask about a triangle mesh structure other than just purely algorithmic ones. Well, one that's going to be very important is how do we represent a function on a surface?
Right? Now, what is the function on the surface? Well, we'll call it f, and f takes points on a guy to numbers. Right? Usually, we think of uh, functions as sort of this heat map looking object, right, which is colored by the value of the function. And our question is, what is a reasonable way to represent one of these? Well, one thing that we could do would be to put a number on each vertex of my triangle mesh on my bunny. Right? So in particular, a function on the bunny turns into a vector in space of dimensionality equal to the number of vertices of my mesh. Notice this is a model for functions on a surface. I could have chosen, for example, one value per face, um, and so on. In fact, we'll revisit this choice a little bit when we talk about exterior kind of this. This is one nice way to do it, and sort of probably the first thing that comes to mind when I ask you for a way to represent a function on a surface that we wrote down as a mesh. Yeah? So maybe with this assumption in mind, I'll ask you another question, which is what is the integral of the surface? Right? So I would say even if our math 52 background is a little shaky, in this case, this, this type of integration is pretty clear. Right? You're going to take a function and multiply it by little bits of area and, and move along the surface. In fact, it's even easier. For example, if my function were per face of my, of my triangle mesh, it would be pretty darn easy to, to integrate this function, at least in some reasonable way, right? by just taking the value on each face and multiplying it by the area of the face and summing all those numbers up. The problem is that that model of a function doesn't have any sort of continuity, right? If I have two adjacent faces on my mesh, I'll just have two values that are meeting up to each other on an edge, and they just run right into each other, and you have no idea uh, 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 sort of how they transition between, between you know, one face and the next. So what are some different viewpoints for how we can integrate that? Well, one important one that we'll return to later is this idea of finite elements. Right? The idea of finite elements, how many people have seen this before, by the way? I think we have some seen you guys here, yeah. Um, is that we'll put a value on each vertex of my triangle mesh, and then to get a function along the entire surface that has some degree of continuity, all I'll do is I will interpolate that function from the vertex to the neighboring vertices just using straight lines. Right? So what, what that ends up looking like is that each vertex is associated with this thing that we'll call hat function, which is just a straight line going from 1 at bi to 0 at all of its neighbors. Right? The nice thing here is that at least this function has one degree of continuity. Namely, along edges, we don't have this sharp change of values from one to the next. Another thing we could do if we wanted to uh, integrate functions that lived only on the vertices is to think of dual cells being associated with these vertices. So remember how I integrated a function when it was per triangle on my mesh, right? All I did was I took the value of my function, and I multiplied it by the area of face, and I summed all those values up, yeah? Well, I could try and do that on the sort of the primal mesh, right, having one value per vertex. But my question is, what amount of area is associated with this vertex? And so what I could do is I could take my triangle mesh and basically partition him into little pieces around each of the vertices. That's uh, what we can call these things dual cells, right? like I'm calling them omegas here, that are the amount of area that's associated with B if I want to integrate a function that lives at vertex B. Uh, you can think of this as sort of the discrete version of dA, that thing that lives on the, uh, you know, on the integral for uh, the integral sign. Uh, yes, Scott? Wait, so is the green thing the dual cell? Yes. So if you have a bunch of green things, it doesn't cover the entire area, though. Uh, it totally does. So, so what we'll do is, well, if we have vertex here, uh, his dual cell will we'll just touch right on the screen guy. I haven't told you how to construct this green object. I could draw on any blob I don't mind there. Um, but we'll tend to do this in a way that, that will make them play together. And that's an important thing to check, because one thing you wouldn't want to do, right, a very important property is if you integrate the function 1, you get the surface area of your surface. Yeah? And if that doesn't happen, then probably your choice of dual cells was not a very good one. I say that, but then there are plenty of choices of dual cells that are very reasonable that don't give you that property. So anyway, uh, if, if we want to integrate f over the cell, one thing we do would be to just take the value of the center and multiply by the area of the cell. Yeah? So, so, so in particular, one thing we can think about topologically and, and this is only one place where the idea of having a dual to a triangle mesh will be important. 
is that it might be important to not just store the mesh itself, right, this green set of triangles, but to also be able to navigate the dual topology of, of the dual complex, where what we've done is I've replaced each face of my original mesh with vertex, and each vertex with my original face, with, origi with, with the, uh, a face of the dual complex, each edge just is rotated 90 degrees. But what have I done? I've taken my dimensionality structure and I've flipped it backward, right? My faces became vertices, my vertices became faces, and my edges became different edges, right? What does this allow me to do? Well, now, each vertex on my primal mesh, right, like here, here's a vertex of my primal mesh, remember, he's the green guy, is associated with a dual phase, namely this, uh, this pentagon here, which tells me how to integrate a function, right? Because what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to take the primal value of this vertex and multiply it by the area of the dual phase, right? So having both of these data structures around and associating numbers with, 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 with uh, information on either side of this topological flip that I just did can be useful. And in fact, um, we can go back and revisit some of the uh, theorems that we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, the dual, uh, the dual case. We'll notice that basically, once again, all of the dimensionality flips. For example, what is the average valence of a vertex in the dual mesh to a triangle mesh? I know there's a lot of words that are squeezed into one sentence here, so we should step back and parse for a second. Um, so I think you've answered a question. We have somebody, somebody new, maybe? Uh, what's the average valence of a vertex in the dual mesh? Assuming the prime one is the prime mesh. Three. Yes. Why is it three? Well, remember that a vertex in the dual is a face in the prime one. Yeah? So, and what are his neighboring uh, vertices in the dual? Well, they're just sort of centroids you can think of. I love faces in the primal. Or in the, tri in the primal, you've got a triangle. And how many neighbors are there to a triangle? There are three neighboring faces. So that means that the valence of vertex on the dual of a triangle mesh has got to be three. Cool. These are fun uh, questions to think about. Yeah? It's not just the average valence, it's the exact valence. It's the exact valence except if you're on the boundary. Like on the boundary, you're right down there. So this is your valence to the average slide is one. Slightly smaller, than it. yeah. Average is the wrong word. I'm sorry. Probably the median is probably a reasonable word to use. Probably. Yeah. Um, why? Why wouldn't creating using cells run into the same problem of having no sort of continuity? It absolutely does. <laughs> um, it's just a, a, there, there are different models for how to think about how to write a function down on a surface, and and usually what we think of is that. A function is a sort of pointwise quantity, right? It associates each point on a, on a uh, 2D or a 3D surface uh, a single value, right? It's, so remember that our zero dimensional objects and our little hierarchy of triangle mesh uh, components are the vertices. So we tend to put zero dimensional information like function values to the vertices. But then we're in a little bit of trouble. So one way to do that. Um, would be to marry this, this zero-dimensional structure, namely vertex, with the two-dimensional uh, dual cell associated with the integrate. But you're right, you still have continuity issues associated with that. That's happened on there. Is there an advantage between the dual cells as opposed to like interpolating the function of the centroid of each face? Uh, you, hmm, is there an advantage in the dual cells? Yeah, we'll make this clear in a few lectures. So what you're suggesting is if I have a value per vertex of this green mesh, what I could do to integrate would be to say that the value of my function on, on the on, is, is on, on this triangle is sort of the average of the values of these three vertices, say. And then what I could do is just take that average and then multiply that by the face area. That's a reasonable model. Um, turns out that we do this sometimes. but. Uh, in general, what you have to be careful about is every time you take an average like that, you've smoothed out your information on your mesh ever so slightly, right? Averaging is sort of a smoothing operator. You have to be very careful how we apply these because they tend to break the differential structure. It turns out that in what you're suggesting actually happens to coincide with how first, first order of finite elements works, but that's, that's something that we have to justify. That's not a fact that we just know ahead of time. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Okay. 
And first idea would be to do the piece by idea decoration. Maybe add something. Okay, so you, you and um, Geller can agree on that. Um, that's a very well <laughs> explored method. We'll come back to that method. First order finite elements. Yeah, it's first order finite elements. Oh. But it's not second order finite elements. So if we want, a, if we want for example, a more stable uh, disposition, that wouldn't be the best one to have. Um, right, so for example, if I'm talking about methods like heat, you know, heat propagation, and I time step in a forward way, then the most information you can propagate in a single time step will be from a vertex and his neighbors, right? So if I have a if I have a signal that's moving across my face very my my triangle mesh very quickly, then this sort of first order method might not be so great. But we should have to think about how we would deal with that. Right? But anyway, we'll return to that. So we can think of having one surface and sort of two meshes associated with that surface. So I forget. Uh, I think it's um, uh, Scott was asking whether. These, these dual cells have to touch one another. And you can see here's a global example of how one might accomplish that. Right? And it's certainly something that you can do by sort of biting edges. Um, and in particular, right, we have one surface and two half-edge data structures that we now need to maintain. And sort of in, in some ways, this, this whole justification has been a long-winded way to introduce one other operator that's going to be, become very important. You'll notice that I'm foreshadowing a lot in today's lecture because I want to set myself up to make future lectures easier, but I notice that that makes things a little bit, a little tough to follow here. But we're going to need one additional operation, which is going to take me from primal objects like vertices to dual objects like dual face. Uh, we might notate that with the star. And um, one way to think about this discreetly is simply uh, rotating 90 degrees for edges and sort of doing nothing for vertices and faces, right? So, for example, if I have a primal half edge this way, then the dual half edge that I could get by applying this operator would be to literally just rotate it 90 degrees, and now I can start moving around the dual mesh. Yeah, this is great because it now just links these two objects together, and I can go from one to the next in a pretty easy way. In fact, uh, this data structure has a name. It's called the quad edge data structure. I believe it actually predates the half edge. Um, and, and we can start to write down similar operations. Like uh, we, can, we can take our flip operator that we talked about for the half edge, right, where we go up and then we point back down. And one way to achieve flip is just by rotating by 90 degrees twice. Yeah? Um, this is another data structure that we'll see uh, when we deal with meshes. It isn't necessarily 90 degrees. Oh, that's true. In fact, I, I'm sorry, I used the word 90 degrees a lot, but really this is a topological operator that's moving me from primal to dual. In fact, a lot of times we don't actually give the dual mesh geometry. Like, we don't give a particular location of a dual vertex because it's like somewhere on a face. But that doesn't prevent us from understanding the topology of the dual mesh independently of that. Cool. Um, Another set of operators that we talk about a lot in geometry processing, not quite so much in this class, but it's something to keep in the back of your head. There's a set of topological operations like vertex removal, collapsing an edge, and so on. And if you revisit some of the data structures we've talked about for uh, uh, storing a triangle mesh, uh, you'll notice that some are easier than others for this sort of an update, which is very important when you have techniques that want to simplify a very complicated mesh to one with fluid vertices. Um, but won't be too important for us. But something to think about just for a good challenge for half edges, and maybe I'll have to do it on your homework, is like what sorts of bookkeeping are you going to have to do to remove a vertex and stitch together the, the edges that are adjacent to it to keep your mesh uh, a nice manifold object. So our takeaway so far is that um, by having sort of nicer data structures, we can have simple traversal, but we're going to have a little bit more bookkeeping, right? If you think about the half edge or the quad edge, these things are pointer soup, right? You've got this, points at that, points at that, points at that, and so on. And maintaining this memory is a little bit tough, right? Your GPU certainly wouldn't like to deal with this. But um, it makes a lot of the operations we'll do in this class a little easier. Notice that triangle meshes, by the way, are not the only ways to store surfaces. Remember I mentioned this at the beginning of lecture? It is important to acknowledge. Uh, just like Adrian talked about, right, you could have multiple views of uh, talking about a theoretical surface, right? Um, sort of the one that, that uh, we've been talking about so far is sort of locally parameterized, right? You can think of a surface as a graph of a function. We certainly talked about that. And we also talked about a function as an implicit, uh, or, or rather a surface as an implicit function, 
right? Namely, for example, maybe you take f of x on all of three space, and then you say your surface is the set of points for which f equals zero. And indeed, there is literature that deals with implicit surfaces. So, so for example, one important application would be if I have a point cloud, like this little fist here, and maybe I don't know how to extract a triangle mesh. But I can begin to approximate a function that tells me how far I am from the surface, given, uh, for example, distance to the closest point. Right? So now I've just associated a function on all of three space, right? which is distance to the closest point of my point cloud. And I can extract different level sets of that function to give me some approximation of the surface I'm trying to deal with. And it turns out that certain operations on these types of surfaces, for example, subtraction, like they've uh, given David kind of an unfortunate tattoo here, um, are much easier to write in this context than they are for triangle meshes. Another important application of uh, implicit math comes in simulation, right? Uh, there's this method called smooth particle hydrodynamics, where you think of doing fluid simulation as moving around a bunch of little fluid particles, right? On the, uh, on, on, and then this makes certain simulation operations easier or harder, depending on how you think about it. Um, Certainly, if you look very closely at fluids in certain video games and, and even in certain film clips, you'll see that eventually when the fluid becomes little droplets, they all start looking like spheres, and that's because they're using SPH. Um, but an important geometric question that's hiding in here, of course, is how do you actually extract the surface of the fluid, given that it's composed of a bunch of these little points? Um, and that, in many ways, is an implicit surface type question. And in fact, in the mechanics of the simulation itself, we have to answer a lot of geometric questions. So one of the really cool applications of some of the geometry we'll talk about that's only sort of starting to be explored in uh, the geometry processing community is that uh, certain things like surface tension for fluids are best expressed in terms of differential geometric information like curvature. And so the, the, the methods that we'll use for computing these can actually then feed back into the simulation loop. Uh, to, to make these things uh, more realistic or, or converge faster and so on. To, in sort of our little cleanup part of lecture today, there, there are some other questions that I should at least acknowledge and, and give you some idea for how we start to answer them, even if it's not our main focus here. Uh, one of them is how do you actually obtain a piece of geometry? Uh, and probably given the, the range of backgrounds we see in this class, everybody has sort of a different picture in the back of their head or how you might get a shape and the level of noise you'll see in that shape, the type of topology you'll see, and so on. So that I'd acknowledge with you. Probably the simplest or cleanest way to get a uh, piece of geometry is to simply design it on your computer with a piece of CAD software. But there are drawbacks here, right? So CAD software tends to, to express services in terms of, for example, smooth patches composed of, for example, cubic objects you might have seen before. Um, which are not triangle meshes, and we need to go back and approximate these things with triangle structure to use a lot of the techniques we'll talk about in uh, 468. Um, in addition, sometimes when you're designing a CAD model, all you care about, or, or, or this happens even more in animation, all I care about is when I step back and look at the surface, it looks right from a distance. Right? So for example, maybe this gear here is really composed of like 25 little parts here, like each of these colored objects is a different piece of the skew model. But in the end, when I manufacture this thing out of metal, it's going to be just one big metallic part. Because it's going to have no idea what this, this object is. But that could be the case. But if, if the geometry that I'm constructing this out of is like 25 different little rings, then when I do my differential geometry on this object, it's not going to look the same as the final thing I want to analyze. Right? So we need to be a little bit careful about how we represent this stuff. Another way uh, to obtain geometry is to, um, once we've designed sort of a rough version of our surface, we might apply some more favorite subdivision operators to get a nice smooth approximation of this object. Um, I don't think we have time to talk about this today. Another important application of the type of geometric analysis we'll do is to understand medical images. Now, in the case of medical imaging, we have these, these uh, these devices like CT scanners, which basically extract a volumetric image of what's going on inside of, for example, your brain. Okay? In particular, what happens is you, you represent your brain as just this big volume of little voxels, right? Each voxel is associated with some density value. 
and then we're going to extract the surface as, as some sort of level set, for example, of the, of, the volume, of the function on the volume that we're talking about. Right? Being able to do this in a stable way is very important for medical applications, where chances are your volumetric scans are now not going to be humongously accurate. Right? We don't have the chance to actually slice open somebody's head and get like a nice 3D laser scan of your brain. This is the best we can do. So we have to come up with a reasonable trade-off between smoothing operators that take this sort of noisy object and give us something we can do differential geometry on. Right? But it might be the case that if we over-smooth, we lose all the interesting information that we thought we had, or our interesting geometry becomes interesting properties of our smoothing operator rather than the interesting properties of your brain. Uh, but that aside, how might we actually extract the surface of your brain? Um, one of the most popular methods uh, for extracting the surface from volume is this thing called margin cubes, which I believe is patented, so apologies to whoever's watching this on YouTube. But uh, the, the idea of margin cubes is that I have a function on all of these voxels, with all these little cubes that my, uh, my volume consists of, and now I want to extract a level set. So if we think about the level sets of my function, right, if I have a positive number on one vertex, a negative number on another vertex, and somewhere in between those two is going to be zero, I hope. And um, the idea of margin cubes is that you can basically enumerate all of the different cases, right? Like, well, I have you know eight vertices on this cube, so if these three vertices have, like, those four, if these four vertices have positive numbers and those four have negative, then I should put edges here. Say, okay? And if we do this in a consistent way, what we can guarantee is that if I follow this little rule inside of this cube and add, for example, triangles as, as I've drawn here, then I can do this with no knowledge of what's going on next to me and guarantee me that I get a nice, at least sort of manifold looking mesh out of it. Um, this is a very clever operator, but as you can imagine, since all of these little cubes have no knowledge of the cubes next to them, Although your surface that you extract might be manifold or have nice topology, the geometry of the surface you get out tends to be very yucky and you'll have to do a lot of cleanup. Um, another question would be if I take a 3D scan of an object like the Stanford Bunny here, how do I actually reconstruct his surface? Right? Well, one, one possibility, which would use the machinery I just talked about, would be to approximate some sort of sine distance function, right? That being just how far I think I am from the surface. So then you can try and give it a sign saying whether I think I'm in the inside or the outside. Right? If, I, if I'm able to approximate that function, then, then, then approximating the surface is pretty easy. I just extract the, the zero set, which we, we already have sort of talked about how to do. But that's not the only way. For example, maybe I take each vertex and I look at its neighboring ver and sort of vertices nearby with respect to three space. And once I have a little pile of vertices nearby, that's enough to approximate the tangent space to my bunny at, at a given center point. And then I can begin to kind of patch together these, these tangent spaces in a nice scope way. Um, there are all kinds of approaches to this, and we can talk about them for hours. Uh, one of the popular phrases that you'll see uh, every which way, if you're taking 268, you will uh, explore in lots of detail at the idea of Delaunay triangulation, which in our context, you can think of as actually uh, you're triangulating a set of points to have a well-behaved dual mesh in addition to your primal, uh, the primal mesh that you're, you're, you're designing. In particular, the Delaunay triangulation is the dual of this object called um, the set of Voronoi cells, right? So if I have a bunch of vertices, then his Voronoi cell is sort of like the, the area in space of, um, rather the area of points in space that are closer to that vertex than any other one in my set that I'm trying to analyze. Um, and, and that creates sort of a volume around each vertex. Right? And, and the Delaunay triangulation is the one that uses the adjacency of these Voronoi cells uh, to patch together vertices. Right? So in some sense, you're dealing with both the vertices and these little dual cells of volumes around them at the same time, and trying to come up with a triangulation that respects both. Um, there are lots of ways to do that, but you are low on time, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, but there are other methods that extract surfaces in completely different ways. This is not the only option, it's sort of a discrete one. For example, on the continuous side, uh, like we talked about before, if we can come up with some function whose zero set is the surface we want to approximate, right, then we can apply margin cubes or some, some refinement thereof to actually extract the thing that we want. 
And one kind of neat application of some of the PDEs that we'll talk about in this class is to solve a, a PDE on the volume around a point set that says, well, locally, I think that this point is here, and I think that it's normal sort of faces this way. And there, you can think of a reasonable way to approximate normal to the surface just given a bunch of points. And maybe locally your approximation is a little bit yucky, but you can solve an equation that says that I want the level set of my function to, to look like the surface that I'm trying to reconstruct, and I also want the normal level set to sort of look like the normal that I've estimated locally. And by trading off with, between these two different uh, parameters in some least squared sense, I can get a function that, whose level sets are, are the, I guess, the armadillo that I'm trying to reconstruct here. So anyway, I, I guess we're about done for today. But, but to sort of keep in mind, the, the main things that we need to worry about are uh, if we construct a triangle mesh, we need to think about the operations that we're going to have to do on that mesh uh, when we choose the data structure that we're going to use to store it. Um, and that, in fact, our options are even wider than that, that a triangle mesh is not the only way to represent a piece of geometry, and that sometimes these implicit objects, for example, might be a better fit for the application that you're considering. And indeed, all the differential geometry we'll talk about in this class can be expressed in this uh, alternative language, although we might not always uh, acknowledge it. And um, there remains to be some really important and, and kind of interesting research about uh, when to apply which operation and which representation um, to a given, a given task that you're trying to complete. So we'll stop there for the day. Um, your, your next homework will go out on this coming Monday. If you want non-zero credit for the previous homework, you should turn it in to, by Friday to Diana. Um, and I think she posted the location of a box and gates for where to do that, but I think we'll stop there for today. One other thing, um, anyone who's uh, taking notes for the class, uh, Remember to email us so that we can give you templates or LaTeX code or pictures or whatever you might, for all material you might need to assemble with your notes. Right, and we're happy to review drafts and give you some comments and so on.